Say that again. Uh, Karosic is uh, name. With the, what's, what's your first, last name start with? Uh, and. And. Are you on my list? Yeah, it should be. Uh, your last name starts, oh, no, 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 I got you, got you. I meant your last name starts with a K or a C, I got you. Yeah, okay, for a sec. Got it, got it. A little sleepy. <laughs> Dropped my wife off at the bus station at 3 in the morning. Oof. Okay, so last time we were in uh, 6.2, and we didn't quite get to the no, 6.2. 6.2 and 6.3, so it was 6.3 when we didn't quite finish the reference angle conversation. In fact, I don't think we even started it. So what I'm going to do is start with reference angles from 6.3, we'll finish this up, and then we'll go into what our scheduled section is, which is 6.4. So, it's, so the way that this will work with the notes online is that I will... Oh, you know what, I should actually open up a different set. I'm going to open up the set of notes that we used on Thursday, and then I can just complete them and then re-upload them so that the reference angle part is completed in there. So let me do that, actually. That'll be a little bit cleaner for you when you're looking at notes. I should have a copy of that. It should be from Thursday. If I follow protocols properly. And we did that slide, but not that slide. Okay. Yeah, so now I'll just update day two's notes that include the end of these. And you'll be good to go on that. So let's talk about a reference angle. And there's a few things. Let me just double check that I had nothing down here. Okay, yeah, we'll finish there. So a reference angle, first and foremost, is an angle that is an acute angle. And here I said that it's a positive acute angle. That's kind of redundant. It is redundant because an acute angle has to be positive. An acute angle is between 0 and 90 degrees, so it's definitely positive. Uh, but I just want to emphasize that it's a positive angle. So I said a positive acute angle. And we have four different possibilities for a reference angle. Slightly different scenario for each quadrant. In general, the rule is that the reference angle for an angle that's in standard position, so when we're looking at these blue angles here, we're imagining the initial ray as the positive x rotating to the blue position. So the blue is the terminal ray. If the angle is in quadrant 1, which means the terminal ray is in quadrant 1, then the angle itself, which is in red, and the reference angle are the same. So the reference angle is drawn with this little primes. Theta prime in all four cases is called the reference angle. And we don't put a direction on it. We think of it as an angle in a triangle. You know, we don't think of it as a rotation. We just think of it as a fixed, a fixed distance uh, rotationally. But we don't have a direction to it. It's always between the terminal ray and the x-axis. So. Let me write that in here. So theta prime is between <coughs> the terminal ray and the x-axis. So in quadrant one, you can see that the terminal ray and the x-axis, that that's the same as the original angle. So theta is equal to theta prime in quadrant two. Terminal ray is in quadrant two. Theta is here. The angle between the terminal ray and the x-axis is right there. That's the acute angle between the terminal ray and the x-axis. And then quadrant three, there's where the reference angle lives. Quadrant four, you can see it over there. Okay, so now the whole point of reference angles is that f of theta, so that f could represent any one of the six trig functions. The value of the trig function of theta is going to be plus or minus 
the trig function of the reference angle. So if you know the reference angle, you can find the trigonometric function value. Then the function value of theta is going to be plus it or minus it. Okay. We'll do some examples so that it can be, so we can get a better handle on it. Okay. You can mathematically prove the, this fact, we'll do it later, um, but the symmetry makes a very compelling case. So let's just take a look at some symmetry. What do I mean by that? So if I take a look at, say, this point on the terminal ray, okay. what we're saying is that if you look at the <coughs> little triangle that's formed here, this would be called the reference triangle. I want to, let me see if I can move my point a little so I don't completely obscure the labeling. Let's get you out there, get you there. All right, so if we drop this perpendicular, the, and let's, let's just look at a couple, of, let's look at one trig function. Let's look at sine of theta prime. So with that right triangle there, if I look at sine of theta prime, what we see is opposite over hypotenuse. Let's call the hypotenuse R. And we'll, let's just call this opposite side here B. So B is the positive number that measures the height of that triangle. Sine would be opposite over hypotenuse. So that's going to be B over R. Now let's take a look at sine of theta. Sine of theta, by definition, when we have a point on the terminal ray, we had our new definitions. And sine was the y-coordinate over the radial distance. That was the new definition if we had a point on the terminal ray. So if we have an angle that terminates in quadrant 2 and we've got a point up there, we call it x and y, then sine of theta by definition is y over r. Yeah, that was our new definition. So if we take a look at theta here in quadrant two, the sine value is going to be the y coordinate there, which is the height here, that's b, over r. So you can see that they're the same. Okay. Now let's look at cosine. So let me call this, uh, <coughs> l let's uh, call let me think about what I want to do. Give me one second as I write this. So let's look at cosine of theta prime, and let's look at cosine of theta. So if we look, let's call this side of the triangle A. Now notice that A is the side of a triangle, so A is positive. A is not a coordinate. I'm using A to measure the length of the base of that triangle. So it's a positive number. If you were to write the coordinates of this point up here, you would have to do minus a comma b to get that negative x coordinate. Does that make sense? So a is the positive distance, the base of that triangle. But if we wanted to move and label a point, here we would use that positive distance multiplied by minus 1 to get the coordinate. All right, so if we focus on the little right triangle here, cosine of theta prime is the adjacent side over the hypotenuse, that's A over R. And cosine of theta, with our new definition, would be the x-coordinate over R. The x-coordinate of our point is minus A, and that would go over R. So you can see that this statement right here is true. And so we didn't prove it, but we looked at a couple of examples, and it's pretty reasonable based on the pictures and the geometry, that sine cosine tangent of theta will be plus or minus sine cosine tangent of the reference angle. The reference angle is always acute, so you can think of it as part of a right triangle. And we know that sine, cosine, and tangent of acute angles are always positive. Right? 
in a triangle, sine, cosine, tangent, always positive because there's ratios of lengths, so they've got to be positive. When we extend our definition of the trig functions, <coughs> then we can get some negative values for sine and cosine depending on our quadrant, and that's what we see here. We see that, okay, the, the reference angle is going to give us a value that's the same in magnitude, if you took the absolute value, same in magnitude, it's just different in sine. You need to know what quadrant it's in to figure out if it's positive or, or, positive or negative. All right. Any questions on that sort of explanation of the values of the reference angles? So let's go ahead and look at some specific examples. Let's take a look at an angle theta that has measure 150 degrees, that's going to give us a reference angle of 30 degrees. And let's just notice what we get. All right, first off, if we want to find the six trigonometric function values of this angle, 150, we need a point on the terminal ray. The reference angle 30 degrees generates a reference triangle <coughs> that's a 30, 60, 90 triangle. And maybe I will flip this triangle so that it looks exactly like that reference triangle over there. So I'll call it the reference triangle. And it's a 30, 60, 90. So that means that we can come up with some sides that make sense, that work for it, 30, 60, 90. And the typical way we go is 1, 2, square root of 3. That's kind of the standard way to do it. The short side is 1. The longest side, which is the hypotenuse, is 2. And then the long leg is root 3. Double check. This squared plus this squared better equal that squared. 1 squared is 1, root 3 squared is 3, so 1 plus 3 is 4, and the hypotenuse squared is 4. So those, that's a legitimate 30, 60, 90 triangle. You could also divide everything by 2 if you want the hypotenuse to be 1, so that it's on a uh, kind of on a unit circle. You could divide everything by 2. That would be another legitimate possibility. Okay, so what, if I use that as the reference triangle, what would be the coordinates of this point on the terminal ray? <coughs> so if that triangle is right here, what are the coordinates of that point if that triangle's positioned here? Negative square root of 3. Mm -hmm. Comma 1, right? Agree, agree? So the terminal ray approach to finding trig values, we only need one point on the terminal ray. doesn't matter what that point is. If you chose as your representative 30, 60, 90 triangle to have one half here, one there, and square root of 3 over 2 there, your coordinates would be negative root 3 over 2, comma, one half. Totally fine. doesn't matter. As long as you have a point on that terminal ray, your ratios will be equal. So... We can now calculate the trigonometric function values for 150 using our new terminal ray definition. What is the sine of 150? Oh, maybe I should label the radius too, right? The radius is 2, so let me just put that on there so that it's clear. So the sine of 150 is 1 over 2, the y coordinate over the radial distance, so 1 over 2. And again, remember that you can think of this alphabetically. C comes before S, X comes before Y, so C is associated with the X coordinate, S is associated with the Y coordinate. Cosine of 150 is then, bingo, tangent is, So y over x, y coordinate over x coordinate, so it will certainly be negative. 
So that's negative 1 over root 3. And if you rationalize that, that's negative root 3 over 3. You can also get to it by doing sine divided by cosine. That also works. So tangent, when you have an angle in standard position, is always the slope of the terminal ray. Rise over run, y over x. <coughs> These reciprocals are what they are. We take the reciprocals. We want to rationalize this. We can. My math lab will want you to rationalize it. So we get that. So now let's notice what we get when we look at this angle of 30 degrees here. So here we'll use the triangle approach, the right triangle approach to get the trig functions of 30. Trig function values of 30 here, sine opposite over hypotenuse, 1 half, cosine adjacent over hypotenuse, root 3 over 2, tangent opposite over adjacent, that's 1 over root 3, which is the same as root 3 over 3. And we flip these over and rationalize. And what we notice is that the values, the six values for the reference angle, are the same in magnitude as the values for the angle theta, 150 degrees. Okay, so there's going to be times when finding the trig function values of theta will be much easier if you find the trig function values of theta prime and then you apply geometry to figure out whether there should be a plus or a minus. So if I'm looking over here, let's look at cosine for example. If I know that I have an angle in quadrant 2, I know the cosine value has to be negative because we're in quadrant 2. And quadrant 2 has negative x's and x is associated with cosine, so cosine would have to be negative. So if I'm looking at this reference angle, I say, OK, I've got the magnitude, root 3 over 2. And then if I'm in quadrant 2, I know that it's got the, sine, the cosine value has to be minus root 3 over 2. If I'm in quadrant 3, it's got to be minus root 3 over 2. Okay? So we could find the trig function values of theta prime, apply geometry, and figure out pluses or minuses. Right, let's take a look at another one. Um, let's do one, I want to do one that's in a different quadrant. Let's go with quadrant four, for example. And let's again, let me think, if we want to pick, let's see, let's pick a, a 45 degree reference angle. And let's just make one more observation that this is, in fact, as we say. So let's suppose that's theta. And we're going to say that theta is equal to 315 degrees. That forces this reference angle here to be 45 degrees. Okay. So if we look at trig function values of 315 degrees, we need to know a point on the terminal ray in order to calculate those. Or we could find the trig function values of 45 and then apply geometry to get the pluses or minuses. Let's actually do it that way first. So we've got a 45, 45. 90 reference triangle. Let's rotate it so that it looks exactly like it does in the picture. So our reference triangle is, is right there. Maybe I'll move this label up a little bit. So our reference angle is there. And that's our reference triangle. The reference triangle is right there. And the convention is to go 1, 1 squared to 2 for our 45, 45, 90 triangle. You can use different numbers if you want. As long as they satisfy the Pythagorean theorem, it's fine. No problem. 
So, our goal is to figure out the trig function values of 315 degrees. Let's first find the trig function values of our reference angle of 45. So let's get one more of these over here. Let's look at 45 degrees. Get those on the board and let's see how we can apply our, re our reference angle values and geometry. So we're going to put 45s here. And what is the sign of 45? Root 2 over 2. What's cosine of 45? Root 2 over 2. Good. And tangent? 1. Mm -hmm. And then if we want to flip these guys, this will be root 2, this will be root 2, and that will be 1. Okay. So that tells us then that we can come up here and we can write these exactly in. We can just do this. That will give us the magnitude of these values. But then we have to use geometry to figure out the pluses and the minuses. So we look at quadrant 4, where our terminal ray is. In quadrant 4, x is positive and y is negative. Okay. So when we look over here, the sign is associated with the y-coordinate. Y is negative here, so this has to be negative. Cosine of 315 is associated with the X coordinate. X is positive in quadrant 4, so this remains positive. <clears throat> Tangent in quadrant 4 is the slope of the terminal ray. It's Y over X. That's negative slope, so this should be negative. And then if you take the reciprocal of a negative, you get a negative. If you take the reciprocal of a positive, you get a positive. If you take the reciprocal of a negative, you get a negative. So that's how we can use the reference angle values to figure out values for theta. Now let's confirm that by using the terminal ray approach. So terminal ray approach, we need a point on the terminal ray. If we have a reference angle of 45, we're bisecting quadrant 4. So there's a whole bunch of points that you can find that bisect quadrant that are on the line y equals negative x that would be on the line that bisects quadrant 4. What's one of them? One, one order pair. Probably the easiest order pair to use would be 1, negative 1. one, negative one. That's probably the easiest. You could use 2, negative 2, 3, negative 3, 4, negative 4, 5, negative 5, pi, negative pi, whatever. As long as you build a point that's on that terminal ray, it'll work. With that point that we've chosen, we then have to find our r value, and we find that our r value will be square root of 2. And then we apply our new definition, sine of 315 is the y value over the radial value. So that's negative 1 over square root of 2, which is negative root 2 over 2, if you rationalize the denominator. To do cosine, we look at our point. We take the x value divided by the r value. 1 over root 2 rationalized is root 2 over 2. Tangent, y over x, negative 1 over 1 is negative 1. It's also the slope of the terminal ray. And then we flip them. So the next question is, well, if I can do this with terminal rays, why would I even care about doing it with reference angles? They don't have a lot of good examples right now in this section where you have to use a reference angle. But we will see once we get to solving trigonometric equations there's going to be situations where you absolutely have to use a reference angle. And so at this point, it's more of an observation and it's more of something to sort of think about that balances the whole picture. If you use your theta or you use your theta prime, the trig function values should all uh, be closely related, plus or minus each other. Any questions on the logic or how we got the values for either of those? 
45 or for 315. Make sense? Good enough? All right. All right, so that's the end of those ones. So let's pause those. We'll do with that later. And let's go to the three notes. All right. Actually, so we already did that. We don't need to do that. Or did we do that one exactly? I forget. Let's not do that one unless somebody wants that one. Does anyone have a specific homework question you want to look at from my math lab or from the textbook? Any ones in general? Do we want to do one more reference angle one, or do you kind of get the picture there? Make sense? I don't mind doing another one if you want to. But. So anything from 6.2 or 6.3 thus far? Um, so you've got a lot of homework that's due next Monday. 6.2, 6.3, and 6.4 are all due next Monday. So make sure you stay on top of that. Can we do 6.2, uh, number two? Absolutely. Do you have a, the problem right there? Uh, I just have what I had written down here. Oh, actually, I think I, I opened my math lab, actually. I opened it. <laughs> Usually we'll open it up before class just to make sure. So you said 622? Yeah. yeah absolutely. 622. So here we want to solve a triangle. So that means figure out the unknown data. So when you're solving a right triangle, you're given three pieces of data, and you've got to find the three missing pieces. So let's go ahead and find angle A first. That's the, the easiest quantity to solve for first. We know one angle here is a right angle. We know the other angle is 65.2 degrees. So we just have to do a little subtraction. Angle A is going to be 90 degrees minus 65.2 degrees. So that'll be 24.8 degrees. That will be angle A's measure. Let me know if you hear any questions, ask. Now let's go ahead and solve for the two sides that are unknown, A and C. And it doesn't matter which angle we use. We can use that one. Right? These angle, we didn't round to get that angle there, that 24.8. So we could use that just as we could use the 65.2. Generally, I use the 65.2 here just because it's in the picture and it's easier to see if I'm looking right here. So yeah. So we want to make sure if we're using the numbers that we come up with, we don't want to round them. Yeah, you generally do not want to use a rounded number in any computation unless you have to. And if you do have to use a rounded number, you want to make sure that you go up a couple of digits beyond what the final answer is asking for. So if they say round to the nearest tenth in the end, and you have to use a rounded number to get there, you want to go out at least two decimals beyond that just to make sure you're not going to have any propagated error as you're, you know, if you round, if they say round to the nearest tenth in the end, and you start rounding to the nearest tenth along the way, you might not get the right answer in the end to the nearest tenth. You want to go two decimals beyond that just to give yourself plenty of wiggle room. <coughs> let's go for side A. So if we want to find side A, let's use the two pieces of information there. Let's use that. So what trig function will use the 65.2, the 127, and the A? Tangent. Tangent. Tangent is a good choice. So tangent of 65.2 degrees will be the side opposite, which is 127, divided by the side adjacent. So we get 127 over A. We have to do a little manipulation here. We multiply both sides by A. We divide both sides by tan 65.2. And somebody typed that into the calculator for me. So we have that. 
Now we're finding a side length here. We will have to rationalize, I did rationalize, we will have to round, and what we would round to in this class, we look to the other side that's given, that's rounded to the nearest unit, so we stay consistent with what they've done already, so we'll round it to the nearest unit, and what do you get when you do that? 59, rounded to the nearest unit. So that will be side A. So now, to find side C, I definitely don't want to use the Pythagorean theorem because I just rounded to get that 59. If you did want to use the Pythagorean theorem, you would want to carry that out two more decimal places and then do the Pythagorean theorem. But we're in trig for a reason. We want to use trig functions. So now let's go ahead and find side C with those same two pieces of information. Let's not. You know, let's not uh, use any of the numbers we computed that might be rounded. So sine, so if we take a look at sine of 65.2 degrees, that's equal to opposite, which is 127, divided by the hypotenuse, which is called C. A little multiplication and division, so we multiply both sides by C. <coughs> We divide both sides by sine of 65.2 degrees. So we get that. And we go ahead and type that into our calculator, 127 divided by, make sure you're in degree mode. And what do we get to the nearest unit there? 140. And they didn't give us any units, so we just leave it like that. And there we've solved the triangle. We've done the three pieces of information. Yeah. Sure. If give me the... Like uh, A was uh, 79 degrees and 37 minutes. Uh huh. So don't we have to change that to DMS to DD before? Um, if you have an angle that's given to you with DMS, you can just leave it as DMS. Just, you would want the other angle that's missing to be DMS also. So I wouldn't change it to DD, I would just do it all in DMS. You know, I think that's the easiest way. All right, any others from homework that you want to take a look at? Yeah? Uh, the height of the bridge is the power story problem. Yeah. Where you get like a cool Yep, yep. Uh, how, with how do you enter the problem? Okay, and that's always the trick. Let's go actually to uh, this notebook, I think, if, if I'm not crazy. There should be an example here, and we can. Where would it be? I could have sworn we did it. Let's climb through quickly. Let's see if we see a bridge right there. Okay, so yeah, that's the hardest, one of the hardest things here. So let's go ahead and look there. So that's kind of what you're going to get. You're going to get typically a numerator and in the denominator you're going to have a parenthetical quantity. So you want to make absolutely certain you can get that number and enter that in your calculator. So here are the two common mistakes. When you're entering it into that calculator, most of these little calculators are going to automatically throw a left parenthesis on the angle. So you have to wrap that angle up by closing that. It's going to stick one there. You've got to close that up. It's going to put one there. You've got to close that one up. If you don't close that one up, it very well could take 39 and divide it by whatever is down here inside the angle instead of treating the numerator as the numerator. Now, because the numerator has no adding or subtraction, you do not need to do this. You don't need to wrap the whole numerator. Will it hurt? No. If your numerator had two terms, terms are separated by a plus or a minus, that had two terms, you would absolutely have to wrap the numerator. In this case, we don't have to wrap it because our predominant operation is multiplication. But you absolutely have to close that angle off or that's going to create trouble. And then when you get to your denominator, so first most common mistake is not wrapping all your angles, which leads to some chaos within your trig function. Second thing is these. You absolutely need your denominator wrapped. So when you type in, the way you're going to type it in, 
negative 900 times tangent 39 divided by left parenthesis, tan 39, wrap, minus tan 62, wrap, and then wrap the whole denominator. So type that in and make sure that you get the 681. It's really important. You don't want to do all that math and then get down and lose, you know, lose points on the computation of the, you know, typing it into your calculator. And that can, and as long as they're balanced, that can be okay. You just have to make sure that angles and the denominator are the biggest two things. So you got the 681? Yeah, I think, I think my problem was I was losing track of the amount of policy. Yeah. And some calculators are really good about highlighting unbalanced parentheses and some, some just let you wallow in your parenthetical misery. Anyone having trouble getting that? Yeah. All right, good. That's, that's super, super important there. All right, any other homework ones you want to look at? All right, so let's go to the next slide then. So now we're going to talk about radians, which... And radians are another measure of an angle. So degrees are the ones you're most familiar with. Those are the everyday measure of an angle is with degrees. You all can picture degrees. You've all heard about them your whole life. And so now we're switching it up to use these things called radians. And first question is, well, why would we want to change? Degrees make perfect sense. And the main reason we want to switch to radians for many <coughs> applications, not all. There's a lot of applications that we still will want to use degrees. But the main benefit to using an angle measure of radians is that when you get to calculus, there are two really important concepts. Calculus 1 is all about two concepts, taking derivatives. Derivatives are basically rates of change, which you've already dealt with indirectly. Slope is a rate of change. So the derivative of a line is just its slope. And calculus generalizes that idea of finding rates of changes of functions. And it turns out that when you're taking derivatives of trig functions, it's much, much easier if the angles are in radians. If they're not in radians, the answer for a derivative problem is really complicated. Maybe I shouldn't say really complicated. It's more complicated. <laughs> the other concept in calculus is called the integral, which the practical application that most of you have heard of is trying to find the area beneath a curve. So you've all done lots of area problems throughout the math courses you've taken. You know, you found areas of all sorts of polygons and different objects, but one thing you haven't done is found the area beneath something that had a curved boundary. And taking the integral of a function allows you to find the area of a region that has a curved boundary. So very practical thing. There's lots of examples where that's useful. Same thing. When you're taking the integral of a trig function, it's easier if the angle's measured in radians, okay? And, I'll ex and we'll see why in a moment here. So first off, this is our definition. We are going to say that pi radians is the same as 180 degrees. This will lead to conversion factors just like you're familiar with. One foot equals 12 inches. You can create two different conversion factors depending on which way you do your division so that you can convert to feet or you can convert to inches. So this being our definition, we can say, hey, let's create a fractional value that's equal to 1. Every time you do a conversion, you multiply by 1. And you're multiplying by 1 where units are different, so you can change the look of an answer, but not the value of it. The value is the value. But you know, 12 inches and 1 foot, same value, different units. So here are the two conversion factors that we'll see. If we divide the radians to the right, we would end up with 
this conversion factor, 180 degrees over pi radians. Or if we divide the other way, we'll have 1 is equal to pi radians over 180 degrees. So a couple of comments here to convert to degrees. We want degrees in the numerator. So if we had a radian number, we would multiply by this to get rid of the radians and be left with degrees. If we had a degree number, we would multiply by this to get rid of the degrees and be left with radians. So let's look at some examples. So our first, let's look at some of our very special angles, 30, 45, those kind of ones. So 30 degrees, if we do the math here, we want to multiply by a conversion factor. We want to get rid of the degrees, so we want the degrees in the numerator to cancel with degrees in the denominator here. So we're going to put the 180 down there and the pi radians up here. Everyone see that those degrees cancel? We have degrees in the numerator and degrees in the denominator, so they cancel. You can think of your 30 degrees as 30 over 1. So those degrees, those units are definitely in different parts of the fraction. One's up and one's down, so they cancel. And 30 goes into 186 times, so we are left with pi over 6 radians. Forty-five degrees. Look at that. Same concept. We want to eliminate the degrees, so we're going to put degrees in the denominator of our conversion factor, so that degrees cancel, we're left with rads. 45 goes into 184 times, so this will be pi fourths or pi over 4 radians. Yeah, absolutely. So why does the radian just move over? To the answer? Yeah. So if we, let's take a look at this one more carefully. So we have 45 degrees times pi radians. In the denominator, we have 180 degrees. So in the numerator right now, if we don't simplify, we would have 45 pi, and our units are degrees, radians. And down below, we have 180 degrees. So you can treat the units just like variables. If you have a degree up top and a degree down below, they cancel. And this radian stays up top because it didn't cancel with anything. There's nothing down below to wipe it out. And then we do have the 45 and the 180 that also can uh, also share a factor of 45. So in the numerator, we're left with 1 times pi times radians, or radians. And then down below, we have 4 with no units left. And so then we generally put the units out to the right instead of in the numerator. That makes sense? All right, 330 degrees. All right, try it. Can you pull it off? Have you been trained well enough? Let me ask now, who came in late that I didn't get on the roster? John Paul? Yeah. And somebody else? Jody. Jody, and your last name is Cooliard? And? Yeah. Sick. Still no George, no Jeffrey, no Ashley, no Tiana. Okay. And no Tom. Multiply by the same thing, pi over 180. Again, degrees cancel. And what did you end up with here as a simplified fraction? Eleven pi over six. Good. Mm -hmm. So thirty degrees. Or 
take away the degree. 30 divides into 180 six times. 30 divides into 330 11 times. Mm -hmm. Now let's go the other way. Let's suppose we are dealing with radians and we're going to convert to degrees. So here you notice that I didn't put RAD on there. And this is how we deal with angles and their units. If you have an angle that's in degrees, you absolutely have to put the little circle to indicate that it's degrees. If you have an angle that's measured in radians, you don't have to put the RAD. It's understood that the angle is in radians if it's not in degrees. So if you don't have the degree symbol on there, that means it's in radians. Now typically, one of the clues that you're dealing with radians is that you see a pi. Most of the time, radian angles are going to have a pi and some fraction, okay, most of the time. So it kind of gives you a clue that, oh, am I dealing with an angle in radians? Yeah, looks like I am. So the way, technical way you know is if you have an angle, if you're told you've got this number that's measuring an angle, if it doesn't have a degree symbol, it means it's in radians. All right, so pi over 12, we're thinking of that as a radian angle. We want to convert to degrees, so we're going to do this. We're going to multiply with our conversion factor, having degrees up top, radians down below. Don't have to put the RAD in there, though, because we didn't put it in the pi over 12. They would cancel if you did put them in both places, but you don't actually have to. So we get that, and then... Uh, 12 goes into there, I think, 15 times. So that will be 15 degrees. Five pi over six. Radians multiply by one. Remember that pi, uh, 180 degrees divided by pi radians is one. So it's multiplying by one. Not changing the value, just changing the units. Once again, we see that, just like above, the pi's cancel. And we end up getting 6 goes into 180 30 times. 30 times 5 is 150. Okay, now this last one, there's no pi in it, but we're told that this is an angle with radian measure. Okay, it's with radian measure, so that's 3 halves radians. <clears throat> Multiply by our conversion factor of 180 degrees over pi. Pi won't cancel this time, but that's okay. <coughs> So we get 2 pushes into the 180 and leaves 90. 90 times 3 is 270, so we end up with 270 over pi degrees. So that's our answer. And if we want to get an approximation, depends on the problem, depends on the instructions, if they want us to move from that exact answer to an approximation, they would have to tell us how many units to round to. I'll just go to one. That would be rounded to 85.9 if they said round to the nearest tenth of a degree. All right, so that's how we use our conversion factors. There's one, I think, pretty obvious question. It's Seems pretty convenient. Seems like it'd be useful to know exactly how many degrees, or maybe I should say approximately how many degrees are in one radian. Just have that as a benchmark. If we're going to be dealing with radians. We know that pi is 3.14. So pi radians is is um, pi radian pi radians is 180 degrees. So 180 degrees is 3.14 radians. But how many degrees is one radian? So let's do that. That's a, a useful benchmark to have. So one radian multiplied by pi, excuse me, 
multiply by 180 over pi. So this will give us a sense of how many, how big a radian is. So we'll do 180 divided by pi. Let's round to one decimal place. So 180 divided by pi, and we get 57.3. So that's one radian, 57.3 degrees, one radian. That's a useful one just to sort of keep you thinking. If someone says, if someone says three halves radians, you're sort of thinking to yourself, oh, okay, one radian is 57.3, and then I've got another, add another half to that. So I divide that by two and add it on top, and you get 85.9. All right, let's look at this more geometrically. So we know already, if we're going to label this, we can label this in degrees very easily. This circle I will refer to as a 12, excuse me, how many sectors are there? Eight. This is going to be called the eight sector circle. The book doesn't break the unit circles apart into eights and twelves. They just mash them all into one. I like to keep them separated because it helps you to see the symmetry really easily. If you take this circle and overlay, well, I guess I can't overlay it that way. Can I? I can't do that either. Oh well. You know what I mean. It, it looks messy. You have all these spokes coming off your unit circle and some of the sectors will have a measure of 15 degrees, some will have 30. I think it's a little messy. I think this really benefits you in terms of trying to visualize. You decide, am I on an 8 sector or a 12 sector, and then go from there. Once you're on the right unit circle, it's going to be very easy to sort of figure out what the relationships are. So, 0, 45, 90, tell me if you have any confusion at all about how I'm getting these numbers. So I'm measuring the pos angle in, in standard position, so these positive angles, counterclockwise rotation. I know that 360 is a full circle. If I divide it into eight equal pieces, that means each piece is 45 degrees. So I'm step counting by 45s. 45, 45 plus 45 is 90, plus 45 plus 45 plus 45, all the way around. So 45 here, we get 225. 45 here, we get 270. 315. So those are the degree measures of the terminal points on the eight sector unit circle. So unit circle just means that it's got radius one. It's not super important at this moment, but I'll put a one in there just to emphasize that I'm thinking of this as a circle of radius one. Okay, let's go ahead and put our radian angles right there. So this would be zero radians. And so I'm just going to put a number with no unit on it, which means it's radians. We just calculated a minute ago that this is pi over 4. Skip counting by 45 is pretty easy. 45, 90, 135, 225, 180, 230, blah, blah. Yeah, it's pretty easy. Now we have to learn to do it with radian numbers, pi over 4. We have to learn to skip count by pi over 4. So we start at 1 pi over 4, and then we get to 2 pi over 4. And 2 pi over 4 simplifies to pi over 2. Right? 2 pi over 4, 2 divides out, so you get pi over 2. So 1 pi over 4, 2 pi over 4, 3 pi over 4 is right here. And then 4 pi over 4. And 4 pi over 4, the 4's divide out, leaving you with just pi. And that was our original definition of radians. Pi and 180 degrees are the same. So that's 4 pi over 4. And then this is 5 pi over 4. <coughs> and then 6 pi over 4, which simplifies to 3 pi over 2. 7 pi over 4. And then if you went all the way back, this would be uh, 2 pi. And in degrees, that's 360. If you do a full revolution, one revolution. 
So in our course folder, in Desire to Learn, you should find under core, let's see, where is it? Under course documents, you will find some blank circles. There's a, a pay, four blank eight sector circles, four blank 12 sector circles. Print those out and you know, practice putting angle measures of both degrees and radians on there so you can get to the habit of doing it quickly. And then very shortly, we'll also add one more feature to these unit circles. We'll find the coordinates of the terminal points. Right now, at this moment, we're just focusing on the degree measure, the radian measure. And then the, the final step is to actually put the coordinates of the terminal points on there. So go ahead, print some of those guys out, and practice. It's the only way to get this down is to practice. OK, 12 sector circle. Label with degrees and radians. So let's think about this first. How many degrees is each sector if we have a 12 sector circle? 30 degrees, because we start with 360, divide it by 12, and we'll get 12 equal sectors of 30 degrees. Bless you. So let's go ahead and put in our degrees first. Skip counting by 30 is pretty darn easy. 30, 60, 90, 120, 150, 180. Two ten, two forty, two seventy. So skip counting by thirty just means add thirty repeatedly until you get to three sixty, because that's where it ends. All right. So skip count by thirty. Now we're going to jump around the circle with radians. <coughs> zero degrees is zero radians, and we know that three hundred sixty degrees is two pi radians. If one eighty is pi. 360 is 2 pi. All right, we calculated 30 already. Let's think of this in another way other than that really mechanical conversion that we did. If we know that pi is 180, if I take 180, if I take pi and divide it into six equal pieces, that's going to be pi over 6. We took pi, which is the semicircle up here, if that's pi radians and I want just one sixth of it, then it's pi over six. So that's going to be our skip counting number. We're going to skip count by pi over six. So then we get two pi over six. And two pi over six has a common factor of two, reduces to pi thirds. One pi over six, two pi over six. 3 pi over 6, that reduces to pi over 2. 4 pi over 6 reduces to 2 pi over 3. 3. Also, focus on fractions here. If you look at the 120 degree terminal point there, you see that, oh, that's 2 thirds of the way to pi. If you think about thirds, there's one third, there's one third, there's one third. So at 120 degrees, you're two thirds of the way. So two thirds of pi will put you at that terminal point. And then here, that's five pi over six. Six pi over six, which is pi, seven pi over six. Eight pi over six, which reduces to four pi over three. Eight pi over six. 9 pi over 6 reduces to 3 pi over 2. 10 pi over 6 reduces to 5 pi over 3. 11 pi over 6. 12 pi over 6 is 2 pi. So you want to get really comfortable with the 8 and the 12 sector circle. You should be able to kind of visualize the symmetry and what the angle measures are in both degrees of radians with a little practice. Knowing your unit circles, degrees, 
radians, and the coordinates, which we'll do very soon, is the only way to make it through trig comfortably. You've got to know your two unit circles. They're the most fundamental tool throughout the whole semester, is knowing your unit circles. So commit them to memory. These are like the multiplication tables for factoring. You can't factor if you don't know your multiplication tables. Or you can, but it takes forever. So it's the same idea. You don't know your unit circle values, it's going to be really hard. <coughs> so you really want to practice now when it's all we're doing is unit circles. You don't want to be trying to figure out your unit circles later when we're solving trig equations and you're using reference angles and you're doing all sorts of other things. You don't want to focus on the fundamentals. So focus on getting those done now. And you'll be good. All right. Let's pause there, take a 10 minute break, and then we'll come back and talk about some other trig. We just got through talking about how to convert from degrees to radians. We now have some visuals for where specific radian measures are. Pi over 6 is here, 5 pi over 6 is over there. You know, we now kind of have a, a decent idea of radian measures. But we haven't defined how to find the radian measure of an angle. And that's what we're going to do now. We're going to define how you find the radian measure of an angle. And that's the formula right there. That's our definition of what theta is in radians. You have your angle. You create a circle so that you have, they call this an included angle. We're going to have an arc, an included angle, and a radius. And we are going to define theta to be that. That will be theta in radians. And the formula is, as long as you know that it's got a theta, an s, and an r, it looks a lot like, like slope. You know, with slope, you talk about rise over run. With theta in radians, we talk about, it's kind of like rise. It's like circular rise over run. So it's s over r. And here is the backstory on why you don't see people labeling angles as ra with radians. You don't see the units on there. You just see pi over 6. Technically, you should say pi over 6 radians, just to make sure it's clear to people, I guess. But a lot, we usually don't. And what I said was that if you don't put a degree symbol, it means it's in radians. And here is kind of the backstory. If you're dealing with a circle, R and S are both lengths. They're both measured in inches or feet or yards or meters or centimeters, right? If you measure the radius of the circle, you choose a unit, like centimeters. If you're measuring the arc around a circle, you choose a unit of length, like centimeters. So if you divide centimeters by centimeters, you are left with a unitless number. Right. It's very similar to slope if your axes have the same units. Like if you're talking about the grade of a road, if you're looking at some mountain road, and you're looking at your horizontal change in feet, your vertical change in feet, you're getting the grade of that road, unitless number. If you're looking at the pitch of a roof, you've got some sort of units of inches, units of inches, they cancel, you get the pitch of a roof, it's a unitless number. So slope often is unitless, just like an angle in radians is actually unitless. And when we say pi over 6 radians, <coughs> we're saying radians just to emphasize that it's not degrees. It's just as correct to say the angle is pi over 6 and not say pi over 6 radians. Um, what we're 
Let's see. What word do you think of that you're very familiar with? What kind of sounds a lot like radian? Radius. And let's suppose, so check this out. So if we let r equal 1, then notice this, that theta and s are the same. They have different units, if you will, because S is certainly measured in inches or feet or some units of length. And theta is an angle. But the magnitude of S and theta are the same if R is 1. So that's interesting. And if we draw a unit circle, circle radius 1, let's just make this observation I heard somebody say somebody said radius the radius of this circle is 1 so let me draw an angle do you remember what the degree measure for the radian for one radian was it's like 57.3 so I'm going to draw that to be just about 57 I'm trying to draw exactly 57.3 57.3 right there so Right there, if this is a unit circle, I've just drawn this to be one radian. So that one is for the radius. This one is for the angle measure. And this one is for the arc measure. So an angle of one radian is found when you've taken that one unit of radius and you've gone one unit along the arc. And regardless of what your radius is, that will be true. If your radius is 5, if you go over to the point on the edge right there, and you start climbing around the circle, if you go 5 units, if your radius is 5 and you go up 5, you're going to come to exactly 57.3 degrees, 1 radian. So the arc will equal the radius at 1 radian. Uh, at, um, yeah, 1 radian. At 1 radian, the arc and the radius are the same. Radius is 5, and you go up 5 here, you've just created an angle of 57.3 degrees or 1 radian. Okay. So let's go ahead, and now we've got this nice, nifty little formula for computation theta equals s over r. Let's just take a peek at this chart. So here we're given s, in, and let me just emphasize here theta in radians. Okay? So if you do S divided by R, you get theta in radians. If you want theta in degrees, you would then have to do a conversion from radians to degrees. But that, gives, that formula is only true if theta is in radians. So that's really important. Theta is in radians. That formula is not true if theta is in degrees. So first one. Let's do the math. So S is 8. Radius is three and a half feet. What's theta? So for 61, theta is equal to s. And that's in feet, and that's in feet, so those cancel. Three and a half, if we write it as an improper as a um, improper fraction. Three times two is six, so add one, that's seven, so that's seven halves goes in the denominator. Dividing by a fraction, you multiply by the reciprocal, so it's going to be 8 times 2 sevenths, which is 16 sevenths. That's theta. And if you don't put anything on it, you know that theta is measuring an angle, so you know that's an angle measure. If you put no units, that means it's in radians. It's never a bad thing, though, if you just want to make it extra clear that you're dealing with an angle in radians, you absolutely can put the RAD on there. Just if, if, it's a, if it's a good clue for you, put it on there. But it's not necessary. All right, let's take a look at the second one. So in 62, we have theta is given to be 45 degrees. But that formula does not work for degrees, so we have to convert this to radians. And maybe you already know that 45 degrees is pi over 4, but if you didn't, you would convert with your conversion factor. So there's theta in radians. That has to equal, uh, let's see, where am I at here? 
So theta is equal to arc length, that one's s, so 200 divided by r. r is unknown in this case. So that's what we have. We want to solve for r. All right, so the left side, if we simplify that, that's 5 or 4. Let me just do that first. And then you can cross multiply here. So you get pi times r equals 800. So r will be 800 divided by pi. So that fits in the middle there. And what would our units be? So that's going to go right here, 800 over pi, and units would be? Centimeters. Centimeters, right. Because the S was given in centimeters, so that's in centimeters also. Exactly. And now this is exact, and this is something we're going to wrestle with all semester. That's exact. <coughs> and you need to know what they want. If they want exact, you leave it like that. If they want approximate, you type it into your calculator, and you get an approximation and you round it to whatever you're told to round it to. So 800 divided by pi, if we wanted an approximation, 254.65 if we go to two decimals, centimeters. And again, who knows? In my math lab, it will tell you. Whenever you enter an answer, it tells you. Round to the nearest, blah, blah, blah. Or if it says leave an exact form, you would leave it like that. So really important to understand the distinction between exact and approximate. When you type into your calculator, like divided by pi or times pi, if you type that in your calculator, you're getting back a decimal. That's an approximation. So when you look at the number pi, that is exact. This is exact. If you look at 3.14, that is an approximation. As soon as you put any decimal representation of pi into the mix, you've approximated. Because pi is an irrational number that has an infinite decimal expansion. So you cannot have, like, you cannot say that that's exact because you've used an approximation to compute that number. So that's not exact. Some people colloquially like to say, oh yeah, that's exact because I know it's 254.67, but that's not how we think of the word exact meaning in math. In math, exact means not approximated. You know, outside when you're measuring your garage, you may, you know, look at your tape measure, 22.5 feet, you're thinking, okay, that's exact. But with pi, if you round it, then you have approximated. If you use 3.14, it's not exact. That's an approximation. And then the last one here, we don't know s. We know the other two. So we know theta is 5 pi over 12. So this one's 63. And we don't know s. And we know that r is 4.2 inches. So to get s, we multiply both sides by 4.2. 5 pi over 12 times 4.2. Type that into your calculator to get an approximation. So we'll do uh, 5 times pi times 4.2 divided by 12. And if we go to two decimal places, we're going to get 5.50. That's measuring length around the edge of a circle, the perimeter of a circle, the circumference of a circle. Inches were given there, so this is in inches. That would be our approximate answer. All right, any questions on those guys? So big formula, theta equals S divided by R. Okay, question. We've got a tire on a Ford Fiesta. Outer diameter is given to be 27.66. Through what angle does the tire turn while traveling one mile? So, 
So, first off, the question is to find an angle. That's what we're looking for. It says, through what angle? So as that tire is spinning, one revolution is 360 degrees, two revolutions is 720 degrees, so it's spinning. If you're thinking radians, two pi radians, four pi radians, six pi radians, eight pi radians, you know? So it's spinning along. And we want to know how many radians occur, how many radians are, um, whatever you want to say, through what angle, how many radians are are going to occur when you go one mile, so that's S. When you've gone one mile, how many radians have gone by? And the R is indirectly given from the, re from the diameter. We'd have to change that though, right? That, so that indicates that the radius is 27.66 divided by two. All right, so let's figure out the rotational angle. Theta will equal, S is one mile. And we're dividing by this fraction, 27.66 divided by two, and that's in inches. So we have a mile up top, inches below. Clearly we have a conflict of units that needs to be resolved. Let's first just clear this up a little bit. 27.66 divided by 2 is going to be uh, equal to 13.83. So this is 1 mile um, divided by 13. What did I say? 13.83. Thank you. Inches. All right, so we have that. So now we start going mad with units. We know that one mile has 5,280 feet in it. We're, we're, we're canceling one of those units now. The miles are gone. But we need the, the units to completely match. So we've got to go a little further. We know that one foot has 12 inches in it. So now feet cancel and inches cancel. So now we are left with a unitless number, <coughs> i.e. radians. So now we have to just type all that into our calculator, not get and not goof up. So we're gonna do 5280 multiplied by 12 divided by 13.83, and we will get 4,581. Did it tell us what to round to? Through what angle in radians does it tell It doesn't say what to round to there, so let's just round it to the nearest 10. If you need to round differently, you would round differently. So that's 4,581.3 radians. Again, you can put those units on there. You don't have to because we know it's an angle. And if there's no units written on that angle, you know it's radians. That's our radian measure. Any question on any steps? How did you get the tune bottom? So that two is coming from the fact that the diameter is twice the radius. In this formula, we're dealing with the radius. Since they gave us the diameter, they always try to trick you. You know, If you need radius, they give you diameter, so you have to find the radius from the diameter by dividing the diameter by 2. This, I think, for a lot of people, is the hardest part of this section, of this chapter in a lot of ways. It's very subtle, and it's something you really haven't had any experience thinking about. So we're going to talk about two different types of speed. 
one type of speed you're super familiar with. That's linear speed. Linear speed is distance divided by time. You do that all the time when you're figuring out how long it's going to take to get from point A to point B. You can drive 60 miles an hour. You know, that's the speed you're familiar with. Distance divided by time. Now, for us, we're going to be thinking about moving in a circle. Rotational motion. So for us, we're going to call distance S. I don't know why they chose S originally for distance around a circle, but that's what it is, arc length. I'm not sure why. But for whatever reason, it's S. So when we see the S measuring distance, we, that's kind of a, an indicator that we're talking about circular motion. So we, we measure that distance, we calculate how long it takes, or we're given how long it takes, do that division, we get linear speed. Sometimes people call it linear velocity. Technically, velocity is a vector, which you may or may not have studied yet. Technically, you shouldn't really use velocity unless you're truly wanting to use a vector quantity. A vector quantity has a magnitude. It also has a direction. So if you say you're going 60 miles an hour, that is the magnitude. But if you're really saying the velocity is 60 miles an hour, you should say 60 miles an hour north, 60 miles an hour east, 60 miles an hour northwest, or whatever. In the, right around this level of class, though, sometimes these books will just say velocity when they really mean speed. <coughs> Now, here's the new thing. Angular speed, instead of distance per unit of time, it's angle per unit of time. So it's the angle traced out per unit of time. That's an omega. You can call it W if you want. If you write it on your paper, it's like a W. Greek letter, omega. So omega stands for angular speed, and we calculate that in a pretty intuitive way. If we're thinking about the angle traced out, and we divide it by the time it takes to trace out that angle, you're going to get some sort of speed measurement, and we call that angular speed. Now, the two are connected with that formula, v equals omega r. And before we figure out why, they are, why that's true, let's think intuitively about what that formula is, a couple of things that that formula is telling us. So this is telling us, when I look at this, I see that as r gets bigger, v gets bigger. Do you see that? So if you have omega, some constant, and you start multiplying it by larger and larger r's, you get a larger and larger v. So as, as that r gets larger, v gets larger. And here's a good way to think of it. If you're on a merry-go-round, your angular speed does not change regardless of how far you are from the axis of rotation. You're still going to go, whatever it is, two revolutions per minute, whatever it happens to be. Doesn't matter if you're on the outside or standing holding the pole in the middle. Your, your angular speed does not change on a merry-go-round if it's going at constant speed. Hopefully it's not jerking around, but you know it's moving at a constant, constant angular speed. It doesn't matter where you are. It doesn't matter how far you are from the axis of rotation. You're going to cover the same number of revolutions per unit of time. That's angular speed is essentially revolutions per unit of time. Now, your linear speed is totally different. The farther you go from the axis of rotation, the bigger the linear distances you have to travel in the same period of time. So your linear speed increases as you move further and further from that axis of rotation. And we've all experienced that when we were kids. If you're out on the edge, you feel the effects more than if you're in the middle. Unless you get, I guess, dizzy from tight spinning. But, but you're moving faster the further you, weigh, the further you are from the axis of rotation. That's what that formula tells us right there. It says to find the linear velocity, we need to know how far we are away from the axis of rotation, and we know, need to know the angular velocity, or the angular speed. Okay? So that's what that formula is telling us. <coughs> OK. So now the question is, well, how did we get that from here? <coughs> 
let's go ahead and take our standard formula for s theta and r. That's theta equals s over r. We solve for s. s is equal to theta r, correct? Now, if we take that and we plug it in up here, we have v equals theta times r over t. And with multiplication and division, those are all commuted. The multiplication is commutative here. You can move stuff around. It's commutative, it's associative. Yeah, more technically, this is the associative law of multiplication. We want to do this division first. But that's, that's legitimate, right? You can take theta, divide it by t, and then multiply by r. Or you could take theta, multiply by r, and then divide by t. And what's theta over t? Theta over t is omega. So that's how we'll get that formula, the angular linear speed relationship from the linear speed formula and our standard theta equals s over r formula. That shows us that that's true. All right, let's go for one of these. So we have a wheel, a 30 centimeter radius. so far. It's rotating at a rate of 3 radians per second. So that is omega. 3 radians per second. What is the linear speed of a point on its rim in meters per minute? Okay, again they want us to do some some unit manipulation. So linear speed. We just saw that linear speed is the angular speed multiplied by the distance from the axis of rotation, or radius, whatever you want to call it. So this is going to be 3 radians per second multiplied by 30 centimeters. All right, let's combine here. So we end up with 90. And I'm going to write centimeters over seconds. And this is where there is some subtlety here. V is linear speed. We know linear speed is distance <coughs> divided by time. <clears throat> That's what we have. Distance divided by time. Centimeters over seconds. Distance divided by time. So you say, well, what happened to the RAD? This RAD right here, again, if an angle is measured in radians, you can put the RAD in if you want, if it's helpful to you. If, you, if you're in a situation where it doesn't make sense, then you take it out. Like here, we know that units for velocity a linear velocity or linear speed should be centimeters per second. It should be length divided by time. So it doesn't make sense to do put the radian in there. You know, it's a unitless number, so it doesn't matter. We only put it in if it's convenient. Like up here, it's convenient. When we say the angular speed is 3 radians per second, that sounds fine. It would be weird to say the angular speed is 3 per second. I'm saying 3 what? So there, it, it's helpful to have the radian in there. It's 3 radians per second. So you can think about, oh yeah, radian's about 57.3 degrees, so it's 3 of those per second. So with linear speed, though, definitely don't want RADCM. You just want distance per time. Now we have to do our unit manipulation, because they said put it in meters per minute. All right, we can put it in meters per minute. So one meter has how many centimeters? 100. 100 centimeters. And then we have to get, so that's good now. Now we're with the proper units. We have meters for distance. 
Now we have to get the time in the right units. They want minutes, so we know that there are 60 seconds in one minute. So a little um, unit conversion. Dimensional analysis. Here the seconds cancel, and we're left with meters per minute. Those are appropriate units for linear speed, and they are the units that the problem is asking for. Looks like we have some beautiful simplification. The two zeros downtown cancel with the two zeros upstairs. So it looks like we're just left with nine meters per minute. Oops. That look good? Yeah. Oh, did I forget the six? Oh, thank you. Yes. Yes, yes, yes. Thank you, thank you. 45? Uh-oh. 45 if you're reading right below. That look better? Yeah, that looks better. Cool. Any questions? All right, let's do the Ferris, the uh, merry-go-round. This one's crazy. So here is the context. So we've got a merry-go-round, and we've got two people on the merry-go-round. We've got the smiley face, Brett. He likes to go fast. He's all the way on the edge, so he can go as fast as possible. His friend Will, no, 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 I'm a pansy. I want to stay closer to the inside. I won't, don't want to go so fast. Or a daisy, I guess. Is that a daisy? Daisy, pansy, <coughs> daisy, daisy. He doesn't like going as fast, so he's a little closer to the inside. All right. <coughs> so we're told how far each. Will is 13 feet 11 inches from the axis of rotation. Brett's 19 feet 3 inches from the axis of rotation. Not too crazy. They give us the angular speed indirectly. They give us this revolutions per minute stuff, which is not technically angular speed. Angular speed is angle per unit of time. We can calculate angle per unit of time from revolutions per unit of time, but technically revolutions per unit of time is not angular speed. It sort of allows you to find the angular speed, but angular speed should be angle per unit of time not revolutions per unit of time. <clears throat> okay, so first, and the ultimate question is, what is the difference in miles per hour in the linear speeds of Brett and Will? <clears throat> so, let's first get the formal value for omega, for the angular speed. Let's get away from this revolutions per minute business. <clears throat> we know one revolution is two pi radians. That's the conversion factor that will get rid of these units of revolutions. So those will go away, and we'll be left with radians per minute, which is angle per time, angle per unit of time. That's correct. That's what we want. <coughs> so our omega is equal to 2 times 2.4 is 4.8. We still have the pi. So 4.8 times pi in rads per minute. And again, here it makes sense to leave the unit of radian there. It flows off the tongue better. 4.8 pi radians per minute, not 4.8 pi per minute. OK. So let's see. So is it obvious that? Brett and Will are moving at the same angular speed. Is that part obvious? Right, that merry-go-round spinning. Once it's up to speed, it's spinning around. Doesn't matter how far you are from the axis of rotation, you're still going to cut. You're still going to trace out 2.4 revolutions per minute. Or said another way, both of them are spinning at 4.8 pi radians per minute. So they have the same angular speed. All right, let's figure out their linear speeds. So let's go with Brett first. So Brett's linear speed, it's velocity multiplied by omega r. So his velocity 
we will do 4.8 pi radians per minute multiplied by his distance is 19 feet 3 inches. So I'm going to convert that to just feet. 3 inches is a quarter of a foot. So 19.25 feet would be his distance. And then they asked us to put this in miles per hour. So let's go ahead and do the funny business. We know that there are 60 minutes in one hour. So that will take care of time. <coughs> to get miles per hour, we have one more factor to deal with here. We know that there are 5,280 feet in one mile. So we'll do that. And that will cause the feet to go away. Then we'll be left with miles per hour. We have the radian thing in there, but we can ignore it because we're finding linear speed, which doesn't involve radians. So now we have to multiply that all out properly. So let's go for it. And it's said to round to the nearest. Uh, I thought it said up there somewhere. Maybe it didn't. All right, we'll go to like the nearest hundredth or something just to make sure. All right, so 4.8 pi times 19.25 times 60 divided by 5280. So this is 3.29. Oh, we have to round though. If we round to the nearest hundredth, that would be 3.30 miles per hour. <coughs> That's his speed. We have to go to the other guy. He has his velocity, which is still the same angular velocity. But we have to figure out his distance from the origin. We have to figure out his um, the number of feet he is from the axis of rotation. And let's see. Gotta get back up there. 13 feet 11 inches. So he is 13 and 11 twelfths feet from the axis of rotation. So we'll convert that to an improper fraction, multiply 12 and 13 out 11. We have to do our conversions with units. We'll have a 60 minutes per hour. And we'll have a one mile per 5,280 feet. All right. So we can just type it in the calculator here. Just be wary of this number if you need to convert it to uh, a 167. Thank you. 167 over 12, you can do it like that. Maybe you know how to put in your calculator anyway. You could do 13 plus 11 twelfths. That would also work if you wrapped it up in parentheses. All right, here we go. See if we can all get the same answer. confirmation. All right, and then the question said, what is the difference between the two? So the difference is 330 minus 238. So the difference is make that a 32, 10, 2, 32 minus 23 is 9. So the answer would be 0.92 miles per hour is the difference. It feels pretty significant. They're only going 
you know, a little over three and a little over two, and they're, yeah? I think 13 and 11 twelfths is 143. Oh, is that right? Yeah, because I think 13, let's double check. 13 times 12 plus 11 equals, oh, I get 167. Yeah. Try again. Make sure you get it. Are you getting it? So it's 12 times 13, and then add 11 to that, and you get 167. Okay. Good question. Make sure that you can do those conversions. All right, any questions on any, any, any of the other stuff in there? <laughs> They're not that far apart, though, right? What are they, five feet apart or something? 14 feet versus five feet apart? And that seems like a pretty significant speed difference for just five feet. It's going full mile per hour faster. When you're only talking two and three miles per hour, that's significant. All right. Let's talk about the linear speed of the Earth. Let's figure out how fast we're going. How fast are we moving right now? Pretty fast. It may not feel like it, but we are flying. We are going so fast right now. All right, so the Earth is about 93 million miles from the sun and traverses its orbit, which is almost circular in 365 and a quarter days. What's the linear speed velocity of Earth in its orbit in miles per hour? All right. So we've got our 93 million miles as our radius, radius of our orbit. We do one revolution per 365.25 days. Revolutions per unit time is not the angle per time format that Omega requires, so we have to convert that. And so let's do that first. So Omega is equal to 365.25 revolutions. Did I say that right? No, I didn't say that right. Uh, so it goes 365 and a quarter days per revolution. Um, so where should the, which should be in the numerator, which should be in the denominator? Eventually we want angle per unit of time for omega. We have denominator. So we have right here, we have that one revolution is equal to 365.25 days. So this is like a conversion factor. And you could make either fraction that you wanted. You know, typically, with the ones we just saw, we were given revolutions per minute. So time was in the bottom. And that's what I, I just got goofed up writing that fraction there. So I wasn't thinking carefully. So this. That's our conversion right there. That's, that's the way we want to think of it, because we want revolutions up top, time below, so that when we get rid of revolutions, we'll have angle up top. So I want to have this guy in the denominator. Oops. Won't let me do it. Start over. So one revolution is going upstairs. One revolution takes 365.25 days. Not truly angular until we get radians per unit of time in there. So 2 pi radians is one revolution. We get some cancellation with the units of revs. So we're going to have 2 pi over 365.25. And that will be radians per day. Radians per day. All right, so there's our angular speed in radians per day. So how many radians are in one revolution? 2 pi. That's our important conversion factor. One revolution and 2 pi radians are equal. So V is equal to omega r 
So we've got to take that and then multiply it by the radius of our orbit, which is 93 million miles. So there's our omega. Let's put that in here, 2 pi. I'm going to put the radians up top, days down below. We have to multiply that by the radius, which was 93 million miles. So that answer will be in miles per days. And I think they want it in miles per hour. Miles per hour. So let's get another conversion factor in there. Let's put one day in here. One day is 24 hours. And now we just have to type all that in. Radians we don't care about. Those are going away. Days are vanishing, and we're left with miles per hour. So type all that in. 2 pi times 93, 1, 2, 3, 1, 2, 3, divided by 365.25, divided by 24. 66. 1,659 miles per hour. That is how fast we are moving at this very moment. Huh. No helmets. No seatbelts. So any questions on any of the steps there? Take a look at the next complicated application with angular and linear speed. So we just looked at a really nice example where angular speed at two points didn't change, but the linear speed changed. Okay? The further we were out, the faster the linear speed was. Now we're going to look at another example that's the converse. We are going to have a constant linear speed for a couple of points, but the angular speed is going to be different. So this is common experience on bikes or in, in machinery, car engines. Wherever we have gears or pulleys. So if we think about a bike, that's a good scenario. You can imagine pedaling your bike at a constant speed. And typically, in the front, typically you have, you have the larger chain ring in the front, you've got the smaller, the smaller uh, sprocket in the back. So if you're moving at a constant speed, that little one's got to be spinning at a faster angular speed to keep up with the big one. But we're going at a constant speed, so your chain is moving across the gears, across the, across the sprockets, right? And it's moving at a constant speed. So the linear speed is the same, but the little pulley or the little gear has to be spinning faster with respect to its angular velocity than the bigger one, so it can keep up. That's how you know, we often drive engines and things. We have a little one that drives a bigger one. OK, so question says we've got two pulleys. 50 centimeters in diameter. So right there, little warning bells. We always want to use radius. And 30 centimeters across the diameter of the other one. The larger pulley makes 12 revolutions per minute. Find the angular speed of the smaller pulley in radians per second. All right. So big key here, we have the same linear speed at all locations. If you're a, if you're a piece of dust right there on the belt, you're moving at the same linear speed as a piece of dust on the edge of this pulley, same as a piece of dust on the edge of that pulley, same as a piece of dust over here that's also on the, on the belt or the chain. Linear speed is the same everywhere. All right. So for the big pulley, they told us 
that it makes 12 revolutions in a minute. Our standard conversion factor to eliminate the revolutions and be left with radians per minute. So double 12, we get 24, pi still there, radians per minute. We need the radius of the big pulley, not the diameter, so we divide the diameter by 2 to get the radius of 25 centimeters. And now we need to use our formula for linear speed. V equals omega r. We have our omega, 24 pi radians per minute. We have to multiply by r, that's 25 centimeters. So that gives us 25 times 24. Is that 601 or something? Is that, no, six, what is that? 600? Is that 600? Oh, yeah, that makes sense. Okay, and that's centimeters per minute. So that is our linear speed. If you're a piece of dust on the big pulley, that's your linear speed. And you transfer yourself onto the bell, that's the linear speed of the bell. You transfer yourself onto the little pulley, that's the speed of the little pulley. So the linear speed we found for the big pulley, that transfers over to the linear speed for the small pulley. We can then convert that linear speed into angular speed for the little pulley. So for the small pulley, we still have that V is equal to omega R. Right, that's our formula. We know that the radius of the small pulley is 15 centimeters. Okay. So let's go ahead. We have 600 centimeters per minute. That's going to equal omega for the small pulley. And we could put a small there just to indicate that's the small pulley. That's our general formula. And for us, we're going to compute the <laughs> angular speed for the small pulley multiplied by the radius, which is 15 centimeters. And now we have one unknown. Linear equation, not too bad. So we solve, we isolate the omega sub s. So that's going to be 600. Let me stack my units here. It's always easier if you stack your units. And you're going to divide by 15 centimeters, which is the same as multiplying by 1 over 15 centimeters. 15 goes into there 40 times. Now we've got to think about our units and get our units right. The centimeters are obviously canceling. So, and minutes are down below. We're talking about angular speed. It should be angle per unit of time. So here it's helpful to introduce RAD so that it sounds right. So there is our angular speed in radians per minute. Before I put a box around that, we maybe should double check that we're answering the right question. Find the angular speed of the smaller pole in radians per second. Yeah. All right, so let's con continue on here. We know that one minute has 60 seconds. So let's convert that. That's radians per second. So the 60 actually is convenient. That will go into here 10 times. So then we end up with 10 over 15, which is 2 thirds. So two-thirds radians per second. Now we have the right units. Yeah, question? Um, why did you forget about the pi? Up oh, did I lose a pi somewhere? Well, 24 pi, like where did that pi Oh, it just pi? fell away. Thank you. No, yeah, that's your job. Thank you. Good job. Bonus. So, yeah, that pi still needs to be there. Thank you. And you know it's yeah, and that started when I was looking at this answer. I was thinking, oh, that's interesting. There's no pi in it, and that's why because I've lost it. Pi has been lost. Yes, yeah, so that's 600 pi. Absolutely, good eye. 
That has to be there. 600 pi. And so in the numerator then we're left with just, we're left with, so it is 2 thirds, but the pi is in the numerator. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, 2 pi over 3 radians per second. Yeah. And so you can think of that 2 thirds, 2 pi over 3, 2 thirds pi, that's 150 degrees. So every second we're going a third of a circle. Okay. Let's get all the way back. What's, you know, kind of everyday lingo, we talk in this lingo of revolutions per minute. That's how you buy stuff. You know, you look at disks, you look at power tools, they're always giving you revolutions per unit of the time. So let's get and figure out, let's get back to that unit, revolutions per unit of time. Let's figure out what this is in terms of revolutions per unit of time, just for grins. So we have 2 pi over 3 radian per second. We know that one revolution is 2 pi radians. So if we want to get back to revolutions per second, <coughs> the 2 pi's cancel, and we get one revolution one, wait, one third of a revolution. Oh, I already said that, actually. One third of a revolution per second. Wait, didn't I say? Oh, yeah, one third of a revolution per second. 150 degrees per second. Yeah, one third of a full circle. One third revolution per second. And this should, let's take a look. So a third of a revolution per second. Something seems funny. Something seems funny. Did we just lose some math somewhere? Shouldn't the little one be going faster? Right? The big one is told to be going 12 revolutions per second. Per right? minute, right? What's that? Per minute, right? Oh, 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 thank you. Okay, units are off. Thank you, thank you. Right. So. This was given in 12 revolutions per minute. This is one third revolution per second. Thank you. I was losing my mind there for a minute. If we wanted to get the same unit, so third revolution per second, we would have to multiply by 60 uh, seconds for one minute. And then we get 20 revolutions per minute. Thank you. So let's just analyze that 20 revolutions per minute. So this guy is going at 12 revolutions per minute. And we just computed that this is going at 20 revolutions per minute. What is the ratio of the radii? That's 25 centimeters. That's 15 centimeters. <coughs> the ratio of the radii is 25 over 15. 5 goes into there 5 times. 5 goes into there 3 times. The, so if we multiply 25, um, well, if we multiply 25 by 3 fifths, we're going to get that. If we multiply this by 5 thirds, we'll get that. So the ratio of the radii will always give us the proportion, the pro proportionality constant that we need to actually jump straight to the other RPMs. So if we look at the ratio here, 25 over 15, that's 5 thirds, we can just use that to figure out what that is. You see that? So if we take 12 and multiply it by 5 thirds, we get 20. So the proportionality constant between the radii will be the same proportionality constant between the RPMs. So that's a way that you can check that you went through all that math properly and you ended up with the right RPMs. As long as, <laughs> as, long as your units match. <laughs> Scary. Scary. Scary stuff. All right, let's see. Oh, we're done. Oh. All done. We have one, a minute and a half to spare. There's got to be a question. Anyone have a question? Batman, question?
Question, there's one. Uh, oh, that same problem, but up top? Uh, at the, like where you're doing one, 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 one third. Yep. Can you go back down to one? Yeah. All the way down to here? Yeah. So this, we ended up with a third of a revolution per second. So we said 60 seconds and one minute are the same. So that'll get us back to the same per minute that was given originally. 